Soybeans for construction, why not? Good things come from the garden. We'll also take a look at common lawn problems many of us can have. That's all coming up. Smith, welcome to the show. I'm looking forward to spending the next half hour with you. You know, good things do come from the garden, but some of them are very surprising, like soybeans. Well, you can certainly make tofu with them. I prefer macaroni and cheese personally, but you can also make some surprising building materials such as soybean insulation. How about filling the walls of your home with this stuff? We're going to take a look at this a little further later in the show. We'll also take a look at grass, a source of pride for some and frustration for others. We'll take a look at some drought tolerant grass varieties and some care tips. And if this tofu doesn't look appetizing to you, don't worry, we have a gourmet chef standing by who just may change the way you look at catfish, unless you're like me and love it any way it's prepared. Chef Jeffrey Bates of the Viking Cooking School steps behind the grill, and boy is it good and simple, you just won't believe. He uses a zip top bag for goodness sake. And our viewer mail comes from a guy in Michigan who's trying to stump me. We'll see about that. Stay tuned for a fun show full of news you can use. We'll start with a trip to an Oregon grass farm right after this. Lawns are a great source of pride in this country. The average American homeowner spends about 40 hours a year mowing their lawn. So with a statistic like that, you can see that lawns are a major part of the gardening scene, and they always have been, particularly since the 1950s. Now, one thing I've learned over the years, if you want a beautiful lawn and the best results, you want to start by selecting the right grass for your area. It just makes sense, doesn't it? Recently, I visited a testing facility in Oregon where they're looking at grass varieties that can perform under some very dry conditions. Tammy Brown is a seed expert who sure knows her turf. We were lucky enough to catch up with Tammy where she told us a few of her secrets and shared the ins and out of sod science. I have to tell you, this is not the lawn I knew as a child. I did not grow up with a gorgeous lawn like this. No, we've really come a long ways. Uh, we are always trying to find the next, the best as far as uh, color. You can see we've made huge gains in color and with today's world the way it is, drought has become a very major problem. So, you know, we really are in a different world and you're breeding grasses that can go for a long period of time without a drink of water. That is our goal. Well, how do, how do you, how do you do that? I mean, how, <laughs> how, do, you find a, how do you find an individual grass variety that's just gonna be able to go without a, a drink for four months? In Oregon, you can't guarantee it's not going to rain in the summertime. So we had to create a what we call a rainout shelter. All right. Can we take a look at it? Sure, we can. Okay. All right, I get it. I see what you mean by a rainout shelter. This is quite a controlled environment. Yes, it was specifically designed to keep all the moisture out. We have the plastic sheeting. We've put drain tiles because moisture can actually come in from yeah, outside dirt. and come in for the roots. And come into right. the roots. Right, doesn't have to come in from the top. Right, we yeah. put gutters, try to avoid dripping. Very impressive. And then you can regulate the exact amount of water it gets with this irrigation system. Yes. That's suspended. By doing it this way, we can not only monitor dry down, but we can monitor how fast it greens up. Well, this does not look like a lawn in a desert to me. <laughs> I expected something completely different. I mean, what's the deal? This looks perfect. We are bringing it back. We have uh, taken it all the way down to 25%, and then we brought water back on now, it. Now, wait a minute, what does 25% mean? We've taken it down to 25%. We've taken it down to 25% green, which means oh. each blade of grass, if you count those, right. there's only 25% that is green. green. So, so, so when you would, look at it, it would be 75% brown. How many days has it been in recovery? Uh, this is about 22 days. You're kidding. No. That is amazing. It's just gorgeous. 
So how, how long did this grass go without water? It went about a month. Good grief. And so what did it look like after a month without a drink? Brown. <laughs> brown. Very brown. <laughs> With water being such a valuable resource these days, I mean, you're doing so much for the environment by producing a, a drought tolerant grass. Well, it is a whole new world of lawns. <laughs> it is. Definitely. We're bringing the science into lawns. Now, once you have your lawn established, here's some ideas to make caring for it a little easier on you and your pocketbook. First of all, I only fertilize my lawn a couple of times a year, once in the spring and then again in midsummer, where the fertilizer is specially blended for lawns. You'll find these blends higher in nitrogen than other elements. You see, nitrogen is what stimulates vigorous growth and provides a deep green color. The reason I feed only a couple of times a year is that I discovered that I was growing lots of grass and working myself to death trying to keep it mowed and watered. But by reducing the amount of fertilizer, I've saved myself some time and energy. Another thing to keep in mind is an actively growing lawn this time of year will require about an inch to an inch and a half of water per week. This, of course, will depend on your soil type. Now, lawns can be a source of pride. Just don't let the summer heat get the most of it and you. Now, we all love our pets, but sometimes these little guys can be a source of frustration, right, Sparky? Good boy, come on up here. What a boy, good boy. Over 60 million Americans have dogs, and they have the challenge of dealing with brown spots in their lawn. What causes this? Well, it's the same as over-fertilization. You see, in dog urine, there's a high concentration of nitrogen, which actually burns the grass. You see, the number one thing pet owners can do to avoid these brown spots is to water the area well within eight hours to dilute the high nitrogen level. When these spots go untreated, you'll need to reach for the repair kit to green the grass back up. The grass repair kits are sold commercially, or you can make your own by mixing sand, seed, and a slow-release fertilizer. Okay, Sparky, you can go outside now. Good boy. All right, now you stay right there, because when we come back, we're going to talk about castor beans. The castor bean plant can make an impressive and colorful statement in the garden. They can grow to great heights in no time. This red castor bean, called Carmencita Bright Red, starts blooming in just 80 to 90 days after you plant the seed. But unless you live in a part of the country where winters are mild, castor bean will die after the first frost. Of course, this is no great loss since they grow so fast you can just replant them next year. It's easy to see how such a plant can make a bold statement with these red star-like leaves, bright stems, and brilliant flowers. They're excellent in arrangements, either used fresh or dried. These plants require plenty of full sun, and they'll thrive in any rich, moist, but well-drained soil. One word of warning. If you grow castor beans, caution should be used, particularly this time of year. You see, the seed pods are full of seed, and they're very poisonous. So this is no plant you should grow around small children or pets. Now I discovered these in California, which happens to be where seed expert Renee Shepard calls home. When I met Renee, I asked her about the best way to store seeds from season to season. Help me with something. If someone has packets of seed left over from the previous year, how should they store them and care for them? Cool and dry. Keep your seeds in a cool, dry place in a Ziploc bag or mason jar. Um, they don't really need to be in the refrigerator if they're good quality seeds. The important thing is not to keep them outside on the potting shed or in the garage, but indoors where you'd be comfortable. Now this would also hold true for seed that someone might collect from their own plants and yes. want to hold over from year to year. If you want to collect your own seed and save seed, and I think that's a great idea, the important thing is to have it thoroughly dry um, when you put it away for the season and label it. That's real important. Now a seed that I make sure that I save yearly is from this plant, the hyacinth bean vine. It's an annual vine that produces these pea-like blooms all summer long. I like to plant these where I need a little seasonal visual interest. They're ideal for growing on a fence like this, or on trellises or railings, and they're also great for hiding unsightly signs. You'll find this vine to be a vigorous grower when temperatures warm but I like to get a jump on the season by starting the young plants indoors. The seed are large and dark in color with one white stripe. They're very easy to grow. 
but I recommend that you soak them overnight in water before planting them. This will improve the rate of germination. Once the plant is up and going, it'll begin to flower, and then when those blooms fade, it'll begin to reveal these striking purple pods, which I think are as beautiful as the blooms themselves. Before the break, let's take a look at one more plant for bringing color into the garden. Now, I love this little plant. It's called fanflower or scavola, and this one is called whirlwind white. You see, it's tough and drought resistant. It's an Australian plant that has long trailing branches that are ideal for container gardens and hanging baskets. Now, one note of caution, be sure to check the roots when you're buying this plant. It's often kept too wet in garden centers, causing root rot problems. The plant kingdom is fascinating and it comes into our homes in some interesting ways. These are soybeans just before their harvest. These little beans are highly diverse. They are one of the best sources of high quality vegetable proteins that can be inexpensively produced. Soybeans are used to make a wide range of products from tofu to soy flour, soy milk, and soy oil to the production of vitamin E supplements. Soybeans go beyond nutrition. Recent studies indicate that they can actually help lower serum cholesterol levels. Also, research is underway regarding its effect on reducing breast cancer. Now, an easy and tasty way to use soybeans is to make soy nuts. They become a popular treat. I think they're delicious in salads for a little added crunch. You can prepare soy nuts at home by simply soaking them in water for about 12 hours, then spread the beans on a cookie sheet and roast them for just over an hour at 250 degrees until they're brown and crisp. Then salt them to taste before they cool. There are so many products made from soybeans, you just can't believe it. And we use them every day in our lives. So many food additives. And now they're actually using soybeans to create insulation to insulate our homes. Now I'm planning on using some of this inside my new cottage. And it turns out that the first time that I saw this was actually in the headquarters of Heifer International, a global aid organization, in their state-of-the-art, environmentally friendly building. I was so intrigued, I had to find out how this was made. So I followed the trail to BioBase, located in Fayetteville, Arkansas, to learn more about this fascinating product. Mike, I have to tell you, this is such an amazing process. It's my favorite part. It really is neat, isn't it? It is just to see the insulation grow off the wall. Why is this such an outstanding product? Well, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, spray foam insulation is just, it's growing, literally, <laughs> yes. uh, across the U.S. I have to say it's the green and sustainable component of it that really gets me excited. Absolutely, me too. I mean, that, that is really an amazing thing. And what we're looking to do is to create sustainable environments. And that goes into not only what we're putting inside of the insulation, but what it's doing for the life of the structure. I mean, it is creating homes and buildings that are healthier, they're more environmentally responsible, they're more energy efficient, um, and they're, they're better places to, to live and work. Okay, now here's a letter from a viewer who's trying to stump me, but I think I've got this figured out. Dave in Michigan writes, while on vacation, I was taking a walk and happened to notice these water fountains that are really low to the ground. Dave was kind enough to include a picture. Take a look. Have any guesses as to what this is? Now, Dave, you're gonna have to try harder than that. Well, this is a dog drinking fountain. Now, if you look at parks across the country, you'll find these, and they can come in mighty handy if you're giving your dog a walk, particularly this time of year. And it's not just in big public parks like New York Central Park where you'll find these dog fountains. When I visited Bonnie Doon Farms in California, Gary and Diane Meehan are so crazy about their dogs that they added a dog fountain to their garden design. It's a fun way to include the whole family. Now up next, we're gonna head south for a backyard barbecue, but it's not gonna be a typical barbecue. We're not gonna do chicken or steaks or even tofu. Stay tuned and I'll show you. I'm in Greenwood, Mississippi, and you know, there's always something good cooking here. That's because it's the home of the Viking Cooking School. Let's step out back where Chef Jeffrey Bates has some delicious things on the grill. Come on, let's check it out. 
Today we're going to be grilling some U.S. farm-raised catfish. This catfish was raised right here in the state of Mississippi. I'm going to put it with some fresh herbs, some white wine, and some lemon juice and give it a real summery flavor. We're going to start with a Ziploc bag, put our marinade here. We've got two tablespoons of canola oil, two tablespoons of good drinkable quality white wine. We've got some grated lemon zest, two tablespoons. Some lemon juice, two tablespoons. Got one tablespoon of fresh basil, a tablespoon of fresh dill. It's fresh herbs I was talking about. Got some Dijon mustard here, one teaspoon. And we've got a quarter cup of diced red onion. And we're gonna finish off with some salt and some pepper to taste. And what we do is just mix this up in the bag. We'll place our catfish fillets in here. Beautiful catfish fillets. Zip it up. You just want to move it around, get those herbs and that wine and Dijon mustard and all that stuff going. You want to be careful not to marinate this too long. I'll say about 30 minutes because the lemon juice, the acid, will actually cook the fish. All right, now that our catfish are marinated and our grill is nice and clean and oiled, it's time to get grilling. We're going to take these catfish. We're going to put the presentation side down first which is the side that you want to serve to your guest. You want to grill these for about four to six minutes per side. You'll notice that the fish gets opaque in the center and that fish will actually release from the grill when it's ready on that side. All right, it looks like these catfish are about ready to flip. We'll turn them over. And folks, it's really nice to go outside, be outside, enjoy your grill or your outdoor kitchen, enjoy some beautiful weather. You hear the birds chirping and the dogs barking and everything. It's, it's great to get outside, so get outside and enjoy, enjoy your yard and your patio. Come right off the grill. Got some beautiful white wine, the table's set up. These catfish are ready to go. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to get out there and fire up the grill. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and I hope you learned some things about how to make your lawn less frustrating, as well as that great recipe from Jeffrey. If you'd like any of those tips and Jeffrey's recipe, just check out my website. That's pallensmith.com. Until next time, get out there and grow something. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. This garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile oh, No, I can't help but smile.